Hey bees, welcome to Guests and Gusto, SCAD's new virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators and innovators remaking culture. Today, we're talking to GQ's celebrated creative director at large, Jim Moore. Jim is renowned for bringing men's fashion into the mainstream. He's taught generations of men how to dress, bringing vibrancy and bespoke menswear and giving life to the fantastical possibilities for men's fashions, once thought of as outlandish in the industry. In his time at GQ, Jim has styled models, movie stars, world famous musicians, and US presidents, from Kanye, Drake, and Kobe, to Ralph Lauren, Giorgio Mani, to Jay-Z, Beyonce, and Barack Obama. If you're an icon, you've worked with Jim. His expert knowledge of the industry and ability to anticipate what's next has cemented his status as legend among legends. Jim is joined by Condé Nast photography director, Ivan Shaw. Prior to joining Condé Nast, Ivan was the photography director at American Vogue for two decades. He's published four books, including Hunks and Heroes, Four Decades of Fashion at GQ, which pays tribute to Jim's incredible career. Hunks and Heroes feature some of today's biggest names. So who's your favorite? A, Tom Cruise, B, Kanye West, C, Bradley Cooper, or D, Jake Gyllenhaal? Answer now for a chance to win a copy of Hunks and Heroes. Now, please welcome Jim Moore and Ivan Shaw. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, Eleanor and Carrie, Josh, everyone at SCAD. We're thrilled to be here today. I'm thrilled to be here with Jim. I'm in New York. Jim's in Palm Springs. Um, hi, Jim. And hey, Ivan, how are you? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone at SCAD. This is really a fun opportunity. Yeah, and we're really excited to be here with all the students. It's an amazing opportunity for us. So um, we're going to jump into it and we're going to kind of take a walk through the book and Jim will tell some stories about, you know, the, the pictures themselves and the book. Uh, let's, let's start with the cover, Jim. Hunks and Heroes, Jim Moore, Four Decades of Fashion at GQ, Ryan Reynolds. Kim, tell us a little bit about what you were thinking and why you chose this image for the cover. Well, I'm going to just reel you back as a, a yeah. couple of... Um, a couple minutes here and just talk a little bit about um, Ivan Shaw because without Ivan this book wouldn't have happened and this is an unpaid endorsement <laughs> although maybe he slipped me a 20 I don't know but um, I would say that a lot of people had said over my career you need to do this book and I'm kind of one of those people that looks forward and doesn't really look back and thought that you know this could be interesting but it's gonna be a lot of work and I probably need a good partner so Ivan and it says so in the back of my book and my acknowledgements because I thanked him first. He grabbed me at the elevator, cut me ass one day, and he's like, you're going to do the book and I'm going to do it with you. So he willed it to happen. He made it happen. And it's because of him that um, I'm sitting here today. And I couldn't be more thrilled to be in front of all of you. And I'm excited about answering your questions. And hopefully we can take a little bit of a deep dive into some of the, some of the stories I have and some of the experiences I've had at GQ. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you, you. Ivan. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure, of course. Um, and let's go. Let's jump into it. So okay. um, we'll start with Kobe Bryant. And obviously, you know, with everything that happened, and I know he was a, a friend of yours, correct? Yes. Do we want to start with the cover? Do we, oh, sorry, we guys. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's no, good. good I apologize. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. So you know, everyone's asking me about this cover and why I chose this image, and people seem to be really excited by this cover and it is a little bit provocative and it's it's not really a fashion picture so to speak i mean there is a there is a suit but it's it's on the floor and i think you know when you think about a cover you, you know especially the cover of my book i struggled with the fact that maybe it should be a guy in a perfect suit with a tie bar and a pocket square but then i thought everyone's first question will be what's the suit who what who, what's the tie you know what is he wearing and i think that's more of a question of a magazine book. So um, I always had this image in the front of my mind as being, you know, a front runner. And when I work, had the pleasure of working with Dimitri Levis on this book, he is one of my favorite art directors. He's done some books, a lot of books with Bruce Weber and Dennis Hopper and Robert Maplethorpe and incredible, incredibly iconic characters. And I really feel proud that he was able to uh, design this book. And we worked on it really you know, 
for a long time, a few months together. And we had this picture of Ryan kind of on the bulletin board. And one day he asked me to name a section of the book, which was in the 2000s when we started working with more celebrities at GQ. And I said, why don't we call it Hunks and Heroes? And he said, well, that's the title of your book. Just put that on the Ryan Reynolds picture that you like so much. And there it is. So that's kind of how it happened. And then Ryan, who is a friend of mine and just like the menchiest, wonderful guy is, um, you know, obviously he's handsome, he looks good, he's very GQ, but he's just one of those great people. And I was really proud when him and his wife, Blake uh, Lively gave very big donations to some New York hospitals. And I called it out on Instagram, but um, even more reason why he should be on the cover because he's a hunk and he's a hero. Great, great. All right, we'll dive in now, here we go. Um, Kobe, of course, as you said, a friend of your tragic early passing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about when you met him, what he was like, how you got to these pictures? Kobe is one of those people that, you know, they're one in a million. And about a week before he unfortunately passed, I was on a photo shoot and I was working with a bunch of models and there was a copy of the book in the studio. And one of the guys said, I know you probably hate answering this question, but who's your favorite guy that you've ever photographed? And I really usually try not to answer that question because it's really hard to, to talk about one particular person. But I said, if you're gonna really push me to the wall on this, it's Kobe Bryant. And wow, why Kobe Bryant? I was like, because he's, He's a larger than life hero. He's, he's a mild mannered guy. He's a competitive athlete. And he is just, you know, one of the greatest people I've ever met. He knows his role as a hero. He takes it very seriously. And when he walks in the room, he wants to talk to everyone. And he doesn't want to talk about himself. He wants to talk about you. And he remembers everyone's name. And he's a perfect gentleman. He looks great in a suit. And um, when we lost him, it was, it, it was a big loss, not only for the game and for um, the people that looked up for him, but just the fact that he, he's a great human being. So, you know, he will always remain um, at the top of my list. Amazing. Um, now this is from early in the book and early in your career. And this story is very important to you. It's a real a sort of pivotal moment in your career, in your life, correct? Yes. So, you know, I started GQ and I'm in my early 20s and I get a chance to work with Bruce Weber, which is just unheard of. And I was working in with another editor and I was an assistant at this time, but I was given a lot of responsibility. And Bruce Weber, who took these pictures, and I believe these pictures are totally timeless. I look at them and I think you could run them in an issue of GQ today. And that's probably one of the reasons I love them so much. But also for me, they're very near and dear to me because it was the first time I had been on a Bruce Weber shoot. So Bruce taught me things like, you know, the guy is wearing a white shirt and so is the girl. And he said, you know, let me teach you how to make a white shirt more than just a white shirt. You know, this is a Brooks Brothers white shirt, but right out of the package, it looks like nothing. It doesn't look like the, the guy owns it. So what you need to do is you need to wash it and you need to, you know, dry it and not iron it and give it to the guy and let him play tennis. And when it's all wrinkled and it feels like it's his own and he's just really, you know, almost ready to take it off, then you start taking pictures. And this really resonated with me because on top of being a lover of men's fashion, I learned so much from the fact that, you know, you can take these iconic pieces and make them very memorable by the way you treat them and also the way you treat people. And uh, Bruce was just, you know, so giving during those two weeks we were in Santa Barbara and let me get very involved in the shoot and took me under his wing. And uh, I'll never forget that. We're, we're still very close friends. And up until a few years ago, we were working nonstop with Bruce with GQ and um, just, just one of those incredible visionaries. Um, this is also an important moment earlier in your career. And it's really the haircut that changes everything. And What's going on here? What happened on this shoot? Well, you know, Christian, as you know, from working at Vogue is probably one of the top, you know, top three hairdressers in the world. He was then in 1984 and he still is now. And um, he was always, he's always known for doing something radical. And you don't hire Christian just to be a wallflower or give you a basic haircut. You hire him to move the needle and to do something that's very disruptive. So I said to Christian after we finished doing a shoot, 
said, what can we do with this long haired guy? What can we do to make him feel really edgy and new and give him a haircut that, that no one's seen? So he said, oh, I have some ideas. And he put the long part of his hair up in a clip and started clipping and shaving. And he completely shaved off the sides of his hair, left the top long. And for me, I looked at it and thought, wow. I want, for, my first reaction was like, I wonder if we can run that in the magazine because it looks so radical. And then my second thought was, that's a really genius haircut. And I like to think when I walk around the streets of New York or wherever I am, see kids with you know their hair short on the sides and long on the top i i really believe it came from this this moment of this haircut when this image was in gq amazing um the big 80s wall street power tie stripes this is a, a big shift in men's fashion correct yes very much so 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 you have you know you have this time of you know suspenders and pinstripe suits and wall street and all of that and I'm kind of the person at the magazine that's trying, I'm a fashion editor at this point, I'm doing tons of shoots, but I'm kind of the one who wants to be in the lane of culture, but push against it always. So I said to the woman who was doing our tailored clothing at the time, so she that would mean that she would, her name is Lisa Cohen, she's incredible. And uh, she would go to all the showrooms and pick out the suits and the shirts and ties. And I said, I just need something with a little bit more vibrancy because I'm tired of these paisleys and this kind of, you know, these, these kind of dour prints. If you look at anything from the 80s, you'll see that everything was kind of murky and um, a little bit dusty and fusty. And I wanted something that had a little bit more vibrancy to it. So um, she said, listen, I've seen a lot of striped shirts and I've seen a lot of polka dot ties. And I said, great, let's put that together and let's see what that looks like. So it may not seem that revolutionary now, but in that at that moment, it was a really big deal because it kind of modernized the suit and it made it a little bit more snappy and it helped to create that look, which, which we call very GQ. Yeah. It's so iconic now and that really resonates at that time. Um, this is a really important part of your career as well. Richard Avedon, one of the great photographers of the 20th century. You worked with him many times, correct? Yeah, I probably, he had a contract uh, for four years to do the covers for GQ. So of the over 40 covers he did, I was probably on at least 30 something of those cover shoots. And I just want to refer to the left side of the, the image at this point. So these four pictures are Polaroids that Richard Avedon would send me. And for those of you who don't know who Richard Avedon is, he was really, as Ivan said, the, the quintessential 20th century portrait photographer. It was you know, basically Richard Avedon and Irving Penn, they were, they were the kings. And he had a contract to do four of uh, Condé Nast magazine covers. So GQ, Vogue, Mademoiselle and Self. So he would uh, kind of line us all up and we would shoot, you know, within, you know, a full day, he would have us in the morning and then next would be Vogue and on and on. But every time we got to a close to a cover shoot, he would send me a package of Polaroids of how he saw the cover. And this is a, this is a Polaroid pack that I got um, that referred to a, a shoot we were doing with David Letterman. And David Letterman was going to be on the cover of our comedy issue. So he said, I want to wire a tie. Wanna, so it looks like it's blowing, but you know, you're in on the joke. So you know it's not really blowing, it's just wired. So I said, okay, Dick, cause you called him Dick Avedon as soon as you got to know him a little bit. Um, I'll take care of that. So we wired a time, we did the cover like that. And then on the right hand side is probably the most, one of the most iconic pictures ever to be in GQ, which is the day we shot Michael Jordan with, with Richard Avedon. He didn't know who Michael Jordan was. We had to write the name, his name on his hand, believe it or not, because he couldn't remember um, his name. He was a new athlete. He was a new um, up and coming basketball player that we put on the cover. And Dick, not really being a sports enthusiast, um, wanted to make sure he kept calling him the right name. So he would look at his hand and say, okay, Michael, can you palm the ball? And um, lots of tricks happened that day. Like as, as the day went on, I had to put some gaffers tape on his hand, make sure that the ball stuck on his hand. But for the most part, I look at this and as much as I'd love to include all the images I did with Richard Avedon, this is probably the most iconic one. Yeah, it's amazing, it's amazing. Um, moving on in a very different direction, you start working with Herb Ritz, another iconic photographer of the 20th century, um, in a very different kind of shoot, right? You're outdoors. Yeah, so, you know, we have, you kind of have 
these situations where, you know, we have in the early 80s where all the covers are with Bruce Weber and then that era kind of comes to a close and then a new editor in chief wants to bring in Richard Avedon and then that era kind of ends and we want something that's a little bit more lifestyle. We want the covers not to be shot in the studio. We want them to be shot on location or with sunlight or some, some, something that really connotes um, energy and, and vitality and natural light. So that was her, you know, and he, he was happiest when he was either on a rooftop with a white piece of seamless or he was at a beach. And you remember him from doing the Madonna Cherish videos and so many of the iconic pictures he did of the supermodels in the 90s, like Cindy Crawford and, and Christy Turlington and Naomi Campbell. Um, he did music videos with Janet Jackson. This particular shoot was a GQ shoot and Stephanie Seymour was a young model. And she was probably not to the superstar, the model, the supermodel girl, you know, status yet, but we were using her for this incredibly, you know, vibrant beach shoot. So it was her and three guys and she was in every picture. And, you know, you give her a, a, a beautiful beach, a beautiful girl, good looking guys, some bright colored swimsuits and a beach. And that's the formula for a great shoot. And I know, I know Ivan that Herb worked quite a bit for Vogue as well. Was that yeah. before your time or? Well, yeah, sure. And I started at Vanity Fair early in my career and that's when I first met him and his crew. And um, he was just an extra extraordinary person. He was a wonderful guy. Um, and really he just, he took things to, he's one of those photographers. And I know you've had this with GQ where a photographer who really takes a shoot to another level. You know, it's like, it, it could be a very pedestrian thing if not handled well. And Herb would take a, a celebrity shoot or if he was doing fashion or just a portrait of an actor and kind of take it to this next level. And you see it in his books that he was just creating really iconic imagery. Um, so it was just yeah. extraordinary. It really personified that time, I think too, in Los Angeles, right? Introduced uh, Richard Gere to Cindy Crawford, right? He was the one yeah, that exactly. got married at his birthday party. So it was really of that time. Um, okay, so it's, it's so true what you say about Herb and the pictures could be considered a little simple in a way because I remember he was he was a big fan of you know that bright sunlight that photographers were really afraid of because they didn't like the dark eye sockets or they didn't like the shadows that it cast on the clothes and he would just put the model or the celebrity in the brightest sunlight against a white background and it was magical. Yeah, and he grew up, you know, he grew up in Hollywood and summers in Malibu. He knew those beaches. He knew that light. He knew exactly how to handle it, you know, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, exactly. okay, move on. Now, I know there's a funny story behind this picture. So, if you Oh, yeah. It's, it's a funny, sad story, but not <laughs> tragically sad. Um, so uh, I had seen a, a show by Ray Calcuba, the Comme des Garçons show in Paris, and I was not only delighted by the the clothes, which were kind of a, I would say kind of a super modern futuristic take on Gene Kelly, where all the tops were really tight and the pants were really wide. And I just thought it was revolutionary. And the thing that I thought really pushed it over the top and made it a really exciting, disruptive event is the fact that she used all real people. She used artists, she used actors. I remember John Malkovich was in the show. And I you know, ran back to New York and I said, we have to do a story on this particular show and I think we should do it on young artists of the East Village in New York City. And so there was a burgeoning group of actor, of young um, artists, excuse me, that were up and coming and they all lived in, you know, six floor walk-ups and we had one day to shoot all six of them. And at this particular moment, we're shooting John Curran, who you know at this, it, today is, is, quite, is, is a quite prolific um, contemporary artist. But you know, we're going back 30 years, 30 plus years when I did this picture. And we did the picture, we had to be kind of quick. We worked with Francois Hollard, we worked on Polaroid film. This is actually a Polaroid, which was a big thing back in the 90s. You worked um, a little bit on that. What's that process, Ivan, where you put the, the back of the Polaroid goes in the water and... and oh, yeah, um, I'm not gonna remember, like we call it off the, but it's a negative, it's a Polaroid. Uh, I think it's a 665, which has the negative, I think, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so it's a positive as opposed yeah, to and it creates this kind of blue quality. We thought this would be great for the artists. So, and we were also able to get in and out of these places really quickly. So we took the picture, we're running down the stairs and John Curran, you know, yells down the stairs, Hey Jim, if you want to buy any of these paintings, they're $1,500 each. And I looked at Francois Lard and I said, 
I $1,500, that's a fortune. You know, I would never spend $1,500 for one of those paintings, even though I thought they were good paintings. Yeah, I think. And of course, I'd kill myself because these paintings are worth millions of dollars right now, and they hang a of museum of modern art all over the world. Yeah, add a couple of zeros now. Um, yeah, add a couple of zeros, many zeros. So I could kick myself for that. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit, like into this. Now, this is a really pivotal moment in the history of fashion, right? And men's fashion. Can you talk about it, it a little bit, what happens. Yeah, so we're in, we're in the 90s now, we're in 1995. And I always say the two designers that really uh, embodied the 90s and really disrupted what was happening in fashion were, were um, Helmut Lang and Tom Ford for Gucci. And this is a, this spread our two Gucci collections that follow one right after each other. The one on the right is the fall uh, 1995 collection. The one on the left is the fall uh, 1996 collection. So in 1995, Tom Ford shows his collection for Gucci at, uh, in Florence at a beautiful palace, and it's his, the first time at the helm. He's been working kind of behind the scenes at Gucci, but he's now he is the creative director, the design director. And from the minute the first guy, it was a men's show, from the minute the first guy walks out on the runway with his velvet suit and the shirt unbuttoned to his navel and the you know, patent leather, Gucci loafers, and everything was skinny and sexy and cool. I thought this is a line in the sand. This is, we've entered a new era where men can look sexy and cool. And, you know, Tom Ford is really the one that's defining it. So I, again, you know, ran back to the office and said, we've got to kind of say this loud. So I'm really proud of these two pictures. I love putting them in the book because they really signify a change in fashion when things got really modern and sleek. And, you know, like a lot of designers, Tom has um, his favorite eras. And if you kind of squint or you don't even have to squint, you can see a little tinge of 70s. And that's always been his thing. And even at, with the Tom Ford collection today, you'll always see there's that kind of 70s swagger. But it was, at the moment, it was absolutely electrifying. Right. Um, now you've, you've known a lot of designers over the years. These are two that figure very prominently in your career and in the history of men's fashion, no? Yes. So I really call these the kings and uh, of, of men's fashion. And I often ask myself, or I put, put the question to everyone out there, uh, what would we be wearing today if there were, you know, if we didn't have George Armani and Ralph Lauren? And if you really sit and think about that, you can, you can think about how these two men have really, um, you know, directed men's, the, the men's style and really the, the culture in, in, as a whole. And so you have Ralph Lauren who started, you know, with a tie collection in 1967. And by the 70s, he was off and running. And by the 80s, he has defined an era which he called lifestyle. And Bruce Weber has helped him with the photography, but it's something that comes from the lifestyle that Ralph always wanted and created for himself. And, you know, people who work at Ralph Lauren say, you know, the inspiration always comes from Ralph's closet. It comes from something he's wearing. So this is a true icon of style. Not only is he a great American designer, but it's like, it comes from his own personal style. It comes from his closet. And the lifestyle is really the lifestyle that he lives. And that was really in vogue at the time. It wasn't so much about, you know, showing a slick suit in a studio. It was showing a family all dressed in white on a lawn or, um, you know, in a kitchen drinking a beer like this. Um, it just so happened I was on both of these shoots and it just so happened that, you know, we put them in white t-shirts. And, but so I thought it was appropriate because in a way they both feel like, you know, they're not designing here. They're just kind of, they're having fun and they're, they're, they're living their life. And Giorgio Armani for me is someone who uh, completely reinvented the suit. And someone, I call myself a modernist because I'm always kind of looking looking to the next thing. That's kind of what we do. Fashion editors are always hopefully curious as, as, as the most curious cat. And Armani for me was the one who changed tailored clothing completely because before he came along, suits were stiff and he brought in like much more drapey fabrics. And then in 1991, he completely ripped the shoulder pads out of the suits and took the linings out. And we had this soft drapey kind of, um, feel, the sartorial feel, which was like soft and silky and not, not hard edged and, and 
football shoulder. And he really, you know, so many times, both of these designers, they have these incredible tent poles of, of really strong style statements over the years that have, have really changed the menswear culture. Amazing. Um, again, two other designers that are very important to you, sort of the Tom, which you've, you've talked about Tom and Virgil. So somebody yes. on the scene right now has been, you know, he's been sort of groundbreaking now. Yeah, Virgil, you know, people always ask me, who are you watching or who, who are the young designers you're loving? And there are so many out there right now that I'm watching. And that's really one of the most fun parts of my job. But I have to say, if, if you if you said who's the leader right now, it's really it's really Virgil. I mean, the new leader. Anyways, right. it's not like the you know, it's not like the Tom Fords and the, and the Ralph Lawrence are, are, are sitting back. They're doing their best work ever. But I think Virgil is, you know, he's got a lot of responsibility. He is, um, I was really happy to see that in the last Louis Vuitton show, he was doing tailored clothing and, you know, he was mixing streetwear. I think he's an absolute genius. I think his, his mind goes at a million miles an hour, but he's able to kind of pick things out and, and kind of run with them. And I think he, he's, a, he's a designer for our generation and, and for the future. And I do have a funny story or an interesting story about this Tom Ford picture, which is, um, this was for a minute, a year, to a couple of years ago when he did his second movie. And we had just made a concerted effort not to put a lot of people in black clothes. In fact, we didn't have any black clothes in, in the issue. And I know people who know me know that I wear a lot of black, but I thought this was this would be interesting not to put someone in a classic black tuxedo. So I called Tom up and I was like, I'm coming to do your portrait next week in LA and I have to ask you not to wear black. And he said, how can you ask me not to wear black? That's my uniform. And um, it's like, well, let me see what I can do. And I showed up not knowing whether he was gonna just wear black or what, but Tom is a good guy. He always does the right thing. He showed up with this beautiful, vibrant blue mix and he brought some turquoise jewelry that he um, had just purchased recently from his hometown of Santa Fe. And um, I was so proud of him for wearing a little bit of color for GQ. And awesome. Sebastian Kim took this picture and I think we got the picture in about seven minutes and the rest of the time we, we hung out and ate sushi and had a, had a really fun day. Sounds like a fun day. Really um, this is an interesting shoot. This is a very different take. And what happened that got you to this idea? Well, it's basically a bet that um, Art Cooper, the editor-in-chief at the time, made with me. And it was based on a conversation we'd had about the, um, the clothes that you take on a shoot and the fact that you're arriving the night before the shoot. And he said, have you ever had a situation where the clothes don't show up? And I said, oh, please, Art, don't jinx this you know, because this has never happened to me. He's like, well, you know, let's set the scenario up. You arrive, there's, there are no stores open. You've got to shoot the next day. The celebrity only has four hours from 10 to, you know, two o'clock. And what are you going to do? And I said, well, I would go to the stores that are open. I would go to the big box stores like Target and Kmart, Walmart. And he's like, I love that idea for a fashion story. I want you to do it. So um, it was a dare and we, were, we did it. We took, we took a, a famous model. Um, this guy was probably one of the top models at the time. And we went out to Los Angeles and we found a Kmart and a Walmart and a Target that were close proximity. And we just took him in and we, we styled him with clothes from the store and took pictures of him in the store. And our brilliant art director, Fred Woodward, actually printed the, um, the receipts on the pages. So you could see the price and those were the fashion credits. So I wanted to put this in the book just to show that, you know, fashion can be, you know, big names, but it can also be big box as well. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Um, I know a, a friend of yours, somebody who you've loved to, photo, uh, to style, Chan yeah. tell us about Channing. So Channing is, a, Channing is just the greatest guy, you know, obviously, you know, he wears his heart on his, Sleeve, I, I love the fact that, you know, the, the press was going to make a scandal out of the fact that he used to be a male stripper. And he, mm -hmm. you know, when confronted, he said, yeah, I was a male stripper and actually I'm gonna make a movie about it. So he, he's just that kind of guy. And you wanna kind of, you want the shoot to go on for hours and hours, then you wanna have dinner with him, then you wanna hang out with him. He's just that guy. But the picture on the left is a, is a fashion shoot I did with him, with Nathaniel Goldberg. And it was, a little bit hard to convince Jim Nelson, the editor in chief at the time, that you know Channing was was someone that was up and coming, 
And he's like, isn't that guy a model? And I was like, well, he has a bit part, but he's just gonna look so good in the clothes. So Jim, Jim uh, really pushed you know, me to do this shoot on Channing. And he was really dazzled with the pictures. And then shortly after that, Channing came out with, in his first movie. And the picture on the right is from the cover shoot by Mario Testino. So it just goes to show you that, you know, hopefully, you know, not always, but hopefully we, we bet on the right person. And um, one of our favorite things to do at GQ is to put someone on the cover maybe a little bit before their time or when they first kind of burst on the scene. So this, this, is, uh, this is a really important um, statement of my career also because I get to work with these guys, whether it be Justin Timberlake or Ben Affleck or Kanye West or anyone who has started out in his 20s and I've photographed him all the way up into, um, you know, their 40s. And um, I don't know, Channing's just a favorite. So I decided to write a little anecdote about him. Um, and this is also a very important part of GQ and a part of your career and the art of the upgrade. Tell us how this worked. This is fascinating. This was uh, something that I was just dying to do for years, which was basically a makeover. And, uh, uh, you know, you see guys walking on the street, whether it was New York or I'm traveling and maybe it's a small city or maybe it's in Europe that, you know, are good looking guys. You can tell they're a diamond in the rough, but they're just getting it wrong stylistically. And sometimes the suit looks good, but the shoes are square toe. Or sometimes, you know, the hoodie's out too oversized or the haircut's bad or whatever. So I said to Jim Nelson, we should be doing makeovers. And he said, I don't really love the term makeover, but um, let's call it an upgrade. So the GQ upgrade, this project upgrade became a real trademark. It became a franchise of ours. And we would literally go on the street and look for guys, bring them in the fashion closet, um, make them over and photograph them. So when people see this spread, which is a, one of my favorite spreads, you'll hear me saying that, it's like, it's like my children. That, that's another favorite spread. But I really love this spread because uh, it's pretty eye-popping. And a lot of people think there's, you know, six months in between that this guy had to lose a lot of weight. And I said, no, the picture on the left is, is him on a Tuesday and the picture on the right is him on a Wednesday. So it really shows the power of, of a suit and, and a, a fitted suit and, and how everybody is really could use a little, little upgrade. That's amazing, amazing story. Brad Pitt, another uh, iconic celebrity that you photographed and really interesting guy to work with now. Yeah, he's fun to work with because he's really committed to the creative process and he really wants to be a part of it. And he's the only celebrity, only person I've ever met in my life that actually wants the shoot to be two days. So in this day and age, you usually have publicists, you know, trying to yank the celebrity away after a couple hours, or you're told you only have so many hours and you're trying to squeeze all your pictures into this very short time frame. But Brad really wants, you know, a full two days to kind of flush out the creative process. And I did this shoot with Mario Testino a few years ago, and we had decided because he got this buzz cut recently that this would be a good time to do him a little bit as a grease monkey and do him a little bit kind of like working class. And we, by two, by, no, by three o'clock the first day, we had already done 20 pictures. They were all phenomenal. We had three covers, you know, in our pocket. We were, you know, pretty much done with the shoot. And I said to Brad, I was like, I think we're done. And he said, done for the day. And I said, no, done with the shoot. And he said, I'll see you tomorrow at nine. And <laughs> so we did another 20 pictures the next day. And I think yeah. we ran about 26 pictures, including a gatefold and, and a cover. So um, just a delight to work with and someone who is a great collaborator and someone who is, you need him to hang from the rafters or you need him to do something extreme. He's He's there to make the picture great. Amazing, amazing. Um, Tom Cruise, somebody who's been on seven times seven covers, I think of TV. Yeah, Tom, Tom wins the award. He wins the uh, golden chalice for the number of, the most number of GQ covers seven times. This was a shoot I did with Inez and Minoud and I kind of wanted to bring back a little bit of that risky business. So we, we just went to a suburban home and um, had him do things like water the lawn and, you know, uh, to play basketball. And um, some of the things he was a little bit rusty in doing, he's like, I can hang out of an airplane, but I can't, I don't, I haven't watered many lawns in my life. So he was, uh, he's just the greatest guy, he's self-deprecating, he's wonderful. And for the time you have him, he's like Brad Pitt, he's there and will do 
whatever it takes to make an amazing image. Amazing. Uh, this is funny. How did you get to the Pacific Coast Highway with these two? Well, you know, this was my idea. And, you know, in, in, if I had to do it, I would do it over, I would do it the same. But, you know, by the time we shot them and the time it appeared in the magazine, their, their relationship or their marriage was pretty much over. So <laughs> our timing was, <laughs> we thought they would stay together more than a few months, but, um, you know, Kid Rock and, and Pamela were, you know, for me, that was like, photographic gold, you know, and let's shoot them in Malibu in a really cool, we've shot them at John Lautner house, which is very architecturally significant. Right. We got Michael Thompson, who you know is a, one of the best photographers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did this great story about them at home and what, what that would be like. And at the end of the day, we asked panelists like, okay, we want to do this picture where you're on Pacific Coast Highway hitchhiking. And she's like, okay, let's do it. I was like, is there any apprehension there? And she's like, she's like, no, I'm fine. I just know I'm gonna see one of my kids' teachers. <laughs> but she was a great sport. And even though the breakup had happened by the time the magazine came out, I think the images are really fun and arresting. And just to, just as a side note, that's kind of what you know GQ is, you know, it's 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 taking pictures that are, are a little bit provocative provocative outside the box and um, joyful and fun. And, uh, you know, and we love to work with celebrities that are up for, up for what we want, what we'd like to do. But it's, it's very important for us to make sure nothing looks corny to work with, you know, the best photographers and, you know, all of that. So, I mean, you're, you, I mean, your experience at Vogue was so, is so rich because um, just speaking to the audience now, Ivan was the photo director at Vogue for over 20 years through the, the 90s and the 2000s. And yeah. I can't even imagine what that was like. I mean, you talk about working with the best photographer, Stephen Mizell and uh, Mario and everybody. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure, I'd love to talk about it. I mean, I think, <clears throat> especially in the mid 90s, there was sort of a moment there when we were working with Irving Penn, Helmut Newton, David Bailey, Stephen Mizell, Annie Leibovitz, all doing some of the best work of their careers. and. I think the thing that I remember most from that is that there were moments, for instance, when Helmut Newton sent in a story, there's the famous crutches story that Helmut right. did uh, that was very controversial, a model on crutches, a wheelchair. Um, I remember laying out those pictures and everybody would kind of come into the planning room where we laid out the magazine and everyone just kind of stood in awe of the photographs. And the same thing would happen when one of Irving Penn's pictures would come in a portrait or one of his amazing still life or beauty pictures, so a really radical beauty picture. Everyone would just kind of stand there in awe of it, that there's something very special that just happened and you just kind of couldn't believe that the work they did was so good. And, and that was an extraordinary experience. And after the, you know, Helmet passed and then Mr. Penn passed, I certainly didn't have an experience like that again, but I'll never forget those moments of looking at those pictures for the first time, which have become, you know, some of them become very famous photographs and to have been present for those photographs was amazing. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, and to be the one that has, you know, commissioned them to do the work yeah. and really put, put the whole, put the whole thing together and worked with the, worked with the fashion editors and. Yeah. Ten, Mr. Penn worked with Phyllis Posnick. I was, became fairly close with Helmut Newton, which was amazing. And uh, he became a good friend. And I have a lot of faxes and notes from him and things. It's just, he's a wonderful person, amazing person. So um, uh, let's move on to the next one. We'll I've seen that picture of Helmut Newton in your office. And I, I uh, would, is it safe to say he's your mentor or one of your- well, That picture was when he passed away. I made that picture for the memorial and he's, he's, he's my hero, you know? Yeah, he's my hero. my hero, hunk too, for certainly, but he's my hero. Fantastic. Um, uh, and okay, another pro a hero for to many people, LeBron. Yeah, some talk about a hunk and a hero. Um, LeBron James is someone that you know I've been working with since he was a kid, and he's always had a very defined sense of style. And I love working with athletes because they're excited about being in GQ. You know, they see it as a trophy in a way that they got the cover, but also the fact that you know they're really interested in the clothes. And I'm a, I'm a sports dummy. I don't know a lot about sports, but um, I do know a few things about men's fashion and that's what they're interested in. You know, they're interested in seeing, you know, the latest, you know, clothes from Gucci or that Tom Ford, you know, tuxedo or whatever it is. And 
every time I work with LeBron, it's kind of a, a little bit of a reinvention. And I know that over the years, he's changed stylists every couple of years because he wants his style to evolve. And I really respect that. And I respect the fact that, you know, he's ever changing. And his, you know, he tends to be, you know, flashy, not flashy. You know, he likes, he likes jewelry and he likes things that, you know, have a real look to them. And I think everyone remembers when him and his teammates came on and all the custom made Tom Brown. And you might say, oh, that was flashy, but in a way it was tailored, you know? So he likes things that are tailored and things that make a big statement. Yeah. So he is, anything you put on him, this is, um, Pari, the photographer, works with these incredible colored gels and things. And, you know, once we put that, that, crimson coat on him from Dolce & Gabbana and against his beautiful skin. I think he took like two frames and that was it. Yeah. And there's a presence to LeBron that just, and especially when you put him in fashion and things that he loves, that, um, that just, just exudes. On the left-hand side, there's a, a, there's a, he's wearing a fedora from Nick Fouquet and he brought the hat with him. And I said, is there any way I could send this to Nick right now and have it customized. He's like, well, what do you mean have it customized? And I said, well, I have an idea. He's like, do it, this is exciting. So Nick kind of turned it around in about 30 minutes and I had him put a crown on it because obviously he's called King James. And, but the inspiration for the crown was um, the way that Jean-Michel Basquiat, the painter, would, would paint crowns in a very kind of like, you know, sophomoric way. So anyways, love the wrong. Nice touch. Um, James Pattinson, who we love. Yeah, Robert Pattinson is one of those guys who is, um, you know, up for it, you know. And, you know, I, I, do, I do fittings with, with celebrities. It's really important to me to do it the day before. And sometimes the celebrities are, you know, are really into it. And sometimes they're like extremely into it, you know. And for the most part, they get to kind of look at the racks and see what I put together for them. And at one point we were really loving this tweed suit on him from Ralph Lauren. And then on the day of the shoot, he sits down in the, in the chair and there was something about the picture that just felt a little traditional to me. So I said, let me just try something. So that earlier that morning, the coat that matched the suit, never meant to be put with the suit arrived. And I, I said to Dan Jackson, the photographer, I was like, I think it's gonna be stronger if I just put this coat on. So it's a tweed suit with a tweed coat. And it was just kind of this magical moment where he sat down. I didn't fuss with the clothes. I wanted them to be all kind of screwed up and, and to see the texture and the folds. And um, he ended up taking these three pictures in a row and we ran it as a, as a triptych. And so the, always keep your eyes open, you know, have your plan, know what you're doing, but keep your eyes open for anything that can happen. Right. Spontaneous. You have a motto, no fitting, no shoot, correct? No fit, no shoot. So okay. you have to, you have to come to the GQ closet or a hotel room or I'll come to you, but we have to do the fitting the day before. Right. And what that does is it kind of, it gets the celebrity, you know, the athlete or the actor, whoever you're working with, it, it disarms them a little bit. It gets them excited about the clothes. It's the time you can have the tailor there making sure they fit perfectly. So the next day the celebrity walks in with a lot of confidence. The clothes are custom made for them. You know, at least they're, basted and pinned perfectly for them. And then you can spend the entire day doing a photo shoot. You don't have to fuss with the clothes at all because you've done it already. So I kind of started that policy and it became a big deal at GQ. And I think, um, I'm not sure if a lot of people do it for GQ, but, but I know that we won't, we won't shoot you unless you can come in and do a fit. Yeah. So remember that next time you come to GQ, I would. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, yeah. Some other celebrity shoot, Idris, of course, who you love. Yeah, Idris, I love a, a guy who is, you know, you just put a suit on him and he's like, you know, James Bond. It's incredible. And right. he is, you know, the power of, of a suit, whether it be a three-piece suit from Ralph Lauren or it, it's, a, it's a suit from David Hart. Um, it, it is, you know, for me, it's the essence of what GQ is. And as I, when I was putting the book together with Dimitri and he was, he's really a genius at, at putting the pictures together. And, and although we did it together, I really have to give the bulk of the work, uh, the credit to him because he really knows how to lay out a book much like lay out a magazine. Um, and he said, wow, Jim, you use a lot of cars in pictures. 
And I said, for me, it's, it's the mo it's the ultimate prop, you know, to have a car in the picture. It's kind of like boys and their toys, you know, what could be a better toy than a car? And, um, it's so we, we actually named a section of the book called stars and cars. Um, and we have another Matt Damon, Matt Damon. There we go. Stars and cars, Matt Damon. This is, uh, this is a shoot I did with Matt Damon downtown LA, put him in this gray suit and just kept him in it. And it wasn't a matter of not having a lot of time with him. We had equal amount. We had a lot of time, but just to, goes to show you that sometimes you don't have to show, you know, a lot of different suits. Like I don't think this photograph, this photo shoot would have this cover would have been as impactful if. And there's ten other pictures that were in the portfolio. If I kept changing the suit on him. I wanted to create a character, um, something very cinematic and have him just in this one suit. So the images, we were really free to take black and white images, cropped images, images of him roaming from behind, um, actionable images. And then, you know, we have this perfect gray suit also for the cover. So not that you can do it all the time, because it's only one credit, but it certainly is a way to kind of mix up the, form the formula. Um, you've done a lot of covers at UQ. What's the, I, do you tell me the exact account again? Yeah. Well, the book has a gatefold in it. And there's two, I think there's 240 or 250, 250 covers. And I've done, I think, 512 covers all together. So the, the number of covers in the book is about a half of what I've done in my career. And, you know, I have to say from the first cover to, you know, a cover that I just, did recently, you still have the same nervous energy every time you go on a cover shoot because you need to bring back this image that is like a poster that's arresting and that will, you know, newsstand sales aren't as important, but you know, digital sales are, and you want that image to be interesting and arresting and speak to what's happening in the culture. And if it's not a suit, um, which is what we're seeing a little bit less of these days, it's something, it, even if it's a hoodie, it's got to be something interesting. And you have to, you have to make sure that that person looks their best because they're on the cover of GQ and they're most engaged. And I think that's what makes a GQ cover. Amazing. Incredible. Um, this is where you are. We're looking at where you are right now. Normally when we talk, we're yeah. sitting in a room somewhere else, but you yes. are literally in that, you're in that dining room of that house, correct? Yes. Yes. I mean, listen, we're all at, we're all in our homes and, and, yeah. and, safe, I would hope. And, you know, these are really um, tr trying times, but um, I was lucky enough to buy this house, you know, 25 years ago, and it has served as the backdrop for a few GQ photo shoots. And Ivan, you were the one who said, you got to put your house. No, in, it's, just, yeah. it's in such the, a um, creative inspiration, I think, no? It is. And, you know, years ago when, when Mad Men came out, it, it became very clear that this was going to be a huge um, trend that, you know, going back to the 60s and, and suits and tie bars and pocket squares, so much so that we had to really knock on everyone's door and say, you need to make tie bars and pocket squares because there weren't a lot of them out there. Right. And uh, the first time I shot John Hamm, we shot him in Palm Springs. We didn't shoot him in my house, but we brought him, we brought him here. I'm in Palm Springs. And we shot him in some of the, the most significant 60s architecture in America. And it's always kind of, been one of my happy places and you know it has all the elements you could ever imagine it has you know the it has the desert which is you know geographically it's situated in the mo one of the most beautiful deserts with mountains around it and then it has all this incredible architecture because from this from the 1940s to the 70s um hollywood moved, would have their weekend homes here and they would each there was a lot of one-upmanship with how the houses looked so they would all hire you know world-class architects to build their mid-century homes and so you have you have some of the best examples of mid-century architecture in the world and i just love it a little cloudy today but i still love it uh bradley cooper who, another huge star right now iconic this was in hawaii correct this was in hawaii you know poor me i've got to go to hawaii because he's there shooting a movie so we've got to go all the way to hawaii um which which it's not so bad not so shady not so bad and talk about beautiful houses. We were able to shoot in this really beautiful, um, all redwood home, mid-century home on the top of Diamond Head oh. in Oahu. And 
you know, we shot him in, you know, in suits, we shot him in sportswear. We just kind of used his energy and his charisma to create this, this incredible day at this house and kind of making it seem like he was, we were shooting him at his home. And you probably remember the cover. It's one of, uh, I think, one of the all-time most iconic GQ covers where he's got that kind of, you know, Tiffany box blue shirt on, which matches his eyes with a, with a Ralph Lauren gray suit and gray tie. Right. Um, another very iconic image from GQ and not a guy, a woman this time, Jennifer Aniston. And how did you end up with this picture? I know there's a story behind it. Well, she, her publicist called and said, you know, Jennifer has an idea that she wants to be surrounded by, you know, handsome models um, that don't have a lot of clothes on. And um, she wants to dress in men's clothes. Um, so the, the dressing in men's clothes was, was the, main, the main theme and the, the, the male models was just for one of the pictures. But I said, you know what, I love Jennifer. I really want to go with her idea, but I, want, I don't want to completely dress her in men's suits and Oxford shoes and fedoras, but we used, we used elements of menswear and she's just such a sweetheart and she's just open to so many things that when it was time to do the cover, um, she's like, what do you want, what, Jim, what do you want me to wear? And I said, well, I would love you to wear this tie. And she said, okay, wear, you, with a, what do you think? White, white shirt, pinstripe suit. And I was like, well, I actually just want you to wear the tie. And she took a beat and she's like, well, let's see what it looks like. And, you know, to her credit, she got on set. She took off the robe, the, the tie, if you remember, it covered, this is not the cover, but this is the tie from the cover. It right. covered all the, the right places. And she was, she trusted Michael Thompson, the photographer. She trusted us and the magazine. And of course we let her see the images um, throughout the process. And it was an iconic cover. I think she was really excited by it. And it probably sold more issues than any other, any other GQ in history. I see. Uh, Sometimes you need a woman to do a man's job. Exactly. Another favorite, Army Hammer, favorite, favorite of yours with Peggy Sirota. Yeah. And the fans. So, yeah, so Peggy's a favorite of mine. She is, you know, she knows how to create joy and not make it corny. And on this particular day, we're, we're dealing with, you know, one of those handsome men in Hollywood, Army Hammer. And we're putting him in one of the most beautiful corduroy suits from Tom Ford. And then he's in this really cool 70s car. So how do you throw that off? Because it's almost like too much rich chocolate. You know, it's like it's, it's too handsome and too chic right. and too cool. And, you know, why don't we put an orange soda in his hand? So sometimes you just need the smallest prop that costs 50 cents to, to make yeah. the picture great. And Craig McDean, who's someone that I know you know very well and works a lot for Vogue, um, always told me like a, a number two pencil and a paper cup and a deck of cards. And sometimes that's all you need. Right. Makes it work. Um, so yeah, fun Bill Murray, of course. Yes. So Bill Murray is, you know, sometimes shooting the comedians are not, it's, it's not the most uh, comedic thing out there, but uh, a lot of times they want to get very involved and, and many times you want them to be involved because I can't say to Bill Murray, we want you to just hold up a rubber chicken and smile. You know, they have to really be in on the joke. They have to be part of the concept. So um, whether it be Justin and Jimmy Fallon or whether it be Steve Carell or um, whether it be um, Stephen Colbert, you know, it's like they have, they're, they're very smart people. They, they know what their shtick is and we invite them to collaborate on the idea. Um, Bill Murray just loved the idea of being, you know, super GQ handsome. And then that one thing that just throws it off, which is, which is the, the mascara brush. And again, a, a, a light touch that, that both he and Peggy kind of came up with, which actually makes the whole picture um, that one little prop. And, the, and of course the expression, that kind of deadpan raised eyebrows really makes it. The, what, the picture on the right is Justin Timberlake and Jimmy Fallon kind of mimicking a, a picture from the 60s of, uh, of Jerry Lewis. And right. um, who was the other guy who was in the Rat Pack? Is it Dean Martin? Dean Martin, thank you very much. Great, okay. Uh, Roger Federer, somebody who you, you work with or very close friend? Yes, yes. I'm actually like, he's one of my clients now. I dress him 
for everything. And this is the day we met again for, for me, I have to go to Sam Moritz uh, to uh, photograph him in, in April. We can still see there was lots of snow and, you know, just, a, just the greatest guy, you know, looks amazing in the clothes is, you know, incredibly well-mannered, remembers everybody's name in the room, shakes everybody's hand and talks to them directly. And it, it's a lot of times the thing that I'm impressed with about people is, is not their, is, is certainly it's nice when they have fashion sense. It's certainly nice when they like my clothes. It's certainly nice when they look good in the clothes, but if they're, if they're good people, you know, the way, they, the way they treat the rest of the people in the room. And I've been really fortunate because I think our industry really just, it breeds good people, you know, smart, good people that have great manners and are fun to work with on set. And Roger's another person who, we brought Craig McDean all the way to Samaritz and he knew he was in good company and he just trusted himself to the creatives. And we took these very, what I think are very iconic pictures. Oh, amazing. Um, and Tom Brady. Tom okay. Brady. David Beckham, two, you know, just awesome guys that are very, you know, confident guys who are not afraid to wear fashion. They have their limits as to what they'll wear, but it's like they really love the idea that, you know, you bring you bring the clothes and you do a fitting. I mean, I think both of them were really thrilled with the fact that they could, you know, see what the clothes were the day before. And um, we could work out like what their tent looks would be. But I, I think I love the that. David is wearing that jacket. This is Brooklyn on it. It was a Ralph Lauren jacket that I went up to Ralph Lauren. I saw this jacket on a rig and I thought this is going to be great for our David Beckham story. And then Tom Brady on the left was shot by Inez and Benoud, shot at, at his house in Boston and Giselle made his chocolate chip cookies. And, um, you know, I have so many memories. You show me a picture and I can obviously talk for way too long about each picture. Uh up to Kanye, of course, a very close friend, wrote the introduction with you. Yes. Um, tell us, you met Kanye at a GQ party and he's become yes. a part of your life in many ways. Yes. Right? And Patrick Marshall took these pictures, a big Vogue photographer that you worked with for years. Um, we, you know, I, I met Kanye about 18 or 19 years ago at, a, at an event, a, a GQ event in Milan. And we just kind of locked into conversation and we've been, we've been that close ever since. And I really appreciate, you know, the creative swirl in his mind and we have incredible conversations. And I think he's a, I think he's a style genius and I think he's a genius in so many ways, but, and what people don't know about him or maybe they do, I don't know, is that he's a really good listener and he remembers things and, and he's respectful towards people. And again, it's like, he's a, he's a, great human being and that's another reason why um i really like him but on this particular shoot i went to the mercer hotel with a mood board basically pictures from the runway of how i saw it and i said listen i want us to do a story where you're dressed all in one color head to toe kind of a monochromatic look i said i haven't really done anything like that since the 90s and i think this could look really new and, and contemporary especially on you and he's like, oh, I really like it. It look, really looks dope. And let's, you know, bring a few extra things. But that sounds great. So as always, we did a fitting. Um, we started in the morning. And I had about 50 racks of clothes there. And Jerry Lorenzo was there with us, who is um, the designer for Fear of God. And he was his assistant at the time. And he said, you know, this one to, with this head to toe, color, one color look is cool, but, you know, can we try on a few other things? And so he was kind of encouraging Kanye to, you know, disrupt the one color thing, just to, just to kind of like challenge it to make sure that we were doing the right thing because this was an iconic GQ story. So the, the I kid you not, the, the, and it says in the book, the fitting lasted for nine hours. And, you know, I would go, I would go back and do it all over again. I don't think any of us had anything to eat. I don't think we sat down once. He tried on everything in that room. We came back to the 10 looks that I had put together, the one color dressing. Um, and it was a blast and it was really, it was really fun. And the more kind of disruptive Jerry and Kanye got, the more they realized that the one color thing was, was the way to go. So we came back to the original idea. And I really think this is the impetus for Yeezy. I think this was right before Yeezy. And um, obviously this was in the culture, but, a lot of these clothes were not worn like this on the runway. We, we created
created this look at, at GQ. So I really enjoy that part of it, that kind of image making part of it, where you're really trying to, you're, you're reporting what's happening in the culture, but you're also setting the trends. Uh, this is a huge moment for you, correct? Yeah, this this T-shirt went viral after this girl walked down the runway in a Mark McMary show wearing it. Unbeknownst to me, you can imagine that I turned the shade of purple when I realized all 700 people in the room were looking at me. Um, but and then a few of the celebrities got hold of it and, and did some did some funny um, social memes with it. So um, it's kind of it's kind of followed me and haunted me at the same time, but um, it, it, it's actually the designer just started reproducing it. It's best, it's back online and for sale. So this was um, a pretty cool moment. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, your closet, which I made, I had asked you to photograph, I think. <laughs> this is another thing. I was like, the closet has to be in there. And then, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you pushed me to do these things. And that's, that's why it was such a strong collaboration. And, you know, when you think about, you know, seeing all the GQs I've ever worked on lined up and realizing that there's, you know, 30 to 35,000 images in there that we're going to have to go through. I was kind of panicked and Ivan said, you know, we're going to get through this. Always a positive thinker, always someone who, you know, knows that we can do it. And he said, we'll just, well, this was the summer of 2018. He's like, we'll just come in every weekend and we'll just, we'll just attack it. And we'll do it until we're done. And you were so right to, um, you know, just insist that we we actually look at the actual magazines and put stickies on them and pick our favorite. We got that down to a thousand or so, and then the original, and then got that down to about three hundred. But thank you for that. Well, my, um, my closet is all black clothes, and I'm not saying everyone should wear all black clothes. But at a certain time in your life, you may say to yourself, "Oh, I want a uniform." And it certainly has made my life more streamlined and simple. And I still get excited about buying my, you know, 10th black turtleneck because um, that's who I am. And I like to think of myself much like you said, you know, I don't know if you brought this up, but Irving, didn't Irving Penn used to wear a white lab coat? Uh, I don't think Penn did, but I, you know, I think there are photographers who have, and, but he had a uniform. I mean, he would dress for work and then when he'd get to the studio, he'd put jeans and like a flannel shirt on or a, a denim shirt on. Right. And, you know, he had a uniform. I mean, the photographers had, yeah. you know, helmet had a look for sure. Um, kind of like a Mr. Rogers thing. He would change when he got to the, to yeah. the uh, studio. Yeah. If you look at, if you look at people who are in fashion, who have been at it for a while, hopefully people that are, you know, well-established, you get to a point where you want, you know, my job is to make other people look their best. My job is to be kind of a blank canvas. So I always love the idea of working for Mark Margiela because they do wear white lab coats or being in a situation where I didn't have to, you know, think about what I'm wearing. And it's not that I don't love clothes or love fashion, but I want to, you know, I'm a stylist, I'm a creative director. So I want to really transpose that, um, those ideas on to you, not, it's not really about me. Right. Um, Stephen Colbert, another funny, good friend of yours, funny guy, but you know, man. I remember when I did this shoot and we came up with the idea of shooting them all over New York City at, you know, various, you know, iconic landmarks. And like every other shoot I've done with him, you go to his office, he calls all the writers in, and you sit down and it's, it's basically with, with, the tenacity and the passion of putting together one of his shows, he, you know, the writers and myself and will and Steven will think about ideas for the photo shoot. And this was one of his favorite ideas was to have him sketched, um, you know, by a street artist, but have him be in a bad mood, but the, but the illustrator comes out with a smile. So just again, reinforcing the fact that when, when people, when talent has good ideas, usually comedians or, uh, you know, if you're doing anchors or, or people who are, you know, literary, it's like you, you definitely want to get them involved. Um, President Obama, this was an important moment in your life, a couple of moments, but some, a funny story as well, right? Yeah, I'd have to say that, you know, shooting Obama was kind of the, the pinnacle if you had to say who's your, who, what experience was like the most dynamic and the first picture um, on the left was by Peggy Sirota, and it was when he was transitioning from senator to president. Picture on the right is 
shot by Inez Avenue, and it was when he is transitioning from president to leaving the office. So the swagger is much more um, pronounced and much more charismatic on the right than it is on the left. Uh, and that is indicative of the pictures, but just in the indicative of the way he was. And I was a little bit panicked on both these shoots because I can't, you can't pick the clothes for a president elect or a president. You can't dress them, you can't put you know, credited merchandise on them. So for the picture on the left, I saw a picture of him on the Senate floor and he was wearing an orange tie and a blue suit that I thought was a little bit ill-fitting. So we got a message to him to go home and bring a gray suit and a white shirt and a dark tie. So he walks in and he said, someone in, someone in this room doesn't like what I'm wearing. And that was kind of my introduction to him. But he said, but I have a suit and I hope you like this. So we put him in it and pinned it up a little bit because it was a little oversized. And that was that. And then eight years later, he walks in looking tremendous in this beautifully tailored suit that he might or may or may not have made for him. But the tie was light blue. And you can see that in the little picture that it was light blue uh, when I first met him. And I said, Mr. President, do you remember me? And he's like, oh, I remember you because you didn't quite like the tie I was wearing right. on the last shoot. And the way you're looking at my tie, it doesn't seem like you like the one I'm wearing today. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I said, well, I guess it would be great if you had a darker tie. And he said, I'll go upstairs. No, he said, I'll go home and get one. And I was worried because I knew we only had like 11 minutes with him or something. And I said, well, is that going to take long? And he said, Jim, I love upstairs. <laughs> I don't know what made me say, is that going to take long? But and then he came down with this beautiful black tie and he looked stunning. And what, a, what an incredible man, what an incredible day. What an incredible 11 minutes. Um, sorry, I jumped in. So this recent TQ, uh, French Montana, TQ Middle East, correct? TQ Middle East, and, and sometimes I'll dip around and do shoots for other uh, the other editions. And um, Adam, who's the editor-in-chief of, of Middle Eastern GQ, said, I have an idea. I want to do French Montana. I was like, great, I love French. I haven't photographed him before, but I, he's a, quite a fashion maven. And I want to do him in three cities. And I was like, okay, three cities, they're, they're located in Dubai. So it's like three cities in Dubai, three cities in, you know, California, where, where? And he's like, well, I actually want to do him in three cities in three different countries. I said, all for the same shoot? He said, yeah. So we took French Montana to Dubai, um, Beirut, Lebanon, and Casablanca, Morocco, and, which is his, where he's from, Casablanca. And, you know, we did this over probably six days. So, you know, as soon as we finished, we would get on the plane go to the next place, finish, get on the plane, go to the next place. And this was a picture we took in, in Beirut on one of the side streets. And I've just always loved it because the guys in the back are, you know, breaking for dinner, they're mechanics. And, the, you know, we kind of pulled the scooter out of the street. It was just available light. It was just that magic time of day. We took this picture with Sebastian Kim. And I love the image and it just reminds me of, of you know, an extreme shoot that we did um, because an editor-in-chief really thought outside the box. And, you know, whether, whether you're shooting on a rooftop or all you can afford is a pair of grace, piece of grace seamless, it's like you've always got to think of, of ways to, to make that a tremendous shoot and, and how inspiring it can be to work in restricted situations like we're, we're in right now. Exactly, exactly. Um, recent shoots that you've done for GQ. Yeah, recent shoots. So, um, we did Russell Westbrook, uh, shot that, you know, really close to the airport in Cleveland. And um, Post Malone on the right, we shot that in the studio. Love the idea of putting him in color and we kind of matched the color backgrounds with what he was wearing. Two great guys who were just, you know, just really fun loving and brought tons of energy to it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I just love the way these two pictures look together because of all the color. And, you know, GQ and Condé Nast, you know, is a color, it's, we're, we're a color publishing company. We don't, we don't, we don't um, you know, we don't publish a lot of black and white. I mean, right. what, what, was your, what, was, what was your experience over the years with color versus black and white? Mostly color, right? At Vogue? Yeah, Anna at Vogue just always insisted, always preferred color. And she just really felt it was such an essential part of fashion. And you know what you talked about joy, and the, the color brings joy and, and vibrancy. 
and life. And I think she, you know, she respected a black and white picture, of course, but always, we always lean towards doing great color photography and yes. bringing the color, bringing life to it and feeling life flying. So absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, she, she was the first person I showed the book to. And when we were looking at it, she said, it's so joyful. Yeah. It's so colorful, you know, and and I think she was probably expecting because it was themed, it was a men's themed book that I was going to run a lot of black and white pictures. I know. So I know that she, loves, um, she loves color. So do I, you know. She loves the book. Um, okay, we're almost there. Um, Colin Kaepernick is a really important person to you. Yeah, probably my ultimate hero. I love everything he stands for. This was an incredible moment um i chose to do all make all the clothes black i i chose to to um have ethnically diverse designers design the clothes and make them for him we had a couple weeks leading up to it and then we had to find an undisclosed location because we didn't want to blow our cover we wanted this to be a big review reveal for our minute of the year issue so we right. shot it in harlem and and it was just a tremendous day and um i i worked with him before when he was he, he was on a team and we did, you know, very kind of football centric pictures. And then to have this, yeah. this, this next chapter of his life and to be able to document it, it was really means a lot. I still get goosebumps when I think about this shoot. So strong. Yeah. And there we are. We have finished the book. Um, Jim, thank you so much. That was amazing. I'm going to stop my chair so we can do some questions of Q&A with everybody. So here okay. we go. Um, hi, everyone. Can we hear? And we should have some questions. Everybody, come on. Uh, the winning poll. The, okay, the winning poll answer was Bradley Cooper. Okay. Really? So That's amazing. Yeah, Bradley won. So we need an additional Bradley Cooper story or just something about Bradley Cooper. Just talk a little bit more about Bradley. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that cover we did in Hawaii, right? Yeah. So I've worked a lot with Bradley. Probably, the, I think the first time I worked with him was for The Hangover. We yeah. did him cover with the other guys and um but the day, the day we were in Hawaii he said you know it's gonna you're gonna have a lot of fun with me but it's gonna be I'm really hard to photograph and right. I was like, oh boy I can't I can't take this it's like you're like the most handsome guy in Hollywood and how, why would you be a problem to photograph and he said there's just something about my face you'll see that like if, especially if you want me to smile or especially if you want to get really close up and Peggy Sword and I were just give him the hardest time. But you know what? It was kind of true. It took us about halfway through the, you know, the, the 45 minutes to do the cover to really realize that he needed a little shading or light on his face. But I mean, the guy is so handsome. It was, it was almost comical that we were even having this conversation, but he, he knows his face really well. And he knows that, um, you know, it takes a certain light to make him, to make him look great, but all, you know, and then he's so self-deprecating and he's such a, a, a super fun guy that he, you know, we, we kind of just joked back and forth uh, the rest of the day about it. And uh, another funny story is that same night, he, after the shoot, he grabbed my cell phone by mistake and he went to have dinner with the writer because oftentimes the writer will take, you know, the celebrity bowling or out for beer or out to dinner or whatever. Right. And we kept calling his manager and his managers insisted that he didn't have my cell phone. And I said, well, could he just look at the cell phone because he'd see that as his. He's like, well, he doesn't want to because he's at, you know, and I don't know how this is being communicated, probably through the writer or whatever. He doesn't want to appear rude, you know. Oh no, I know what it is. This, the publicist was at the dinner, sorry. And, um, and then when he realized it, he actually brought the phone to me and there was a knock on my door and it was Bradley handing me the phone yeah. back. He could, have, he could have done that any number of ways and not this time coming back with it. But, and then we stayed, stood in the doorway of my hotel room and just talked for a little bit. And, you know, just such a, such a menschy guy, just is exactly what you think he is. He, he is in person. Okay. okay, so let's see if we can pull up some other question. Uh, are there any fashion trends that you back look back now now and say how did that ever get through? That's from Daniel Brevik. Um, so fashion trend that was you know you're like oh my god what were we thinking? It's sort of funny moments you look back and something that doesn't seem relevant or yeah it was probably it was probably anything in the 80s because <laughs> I don't know if you remember <laughs> if you remember Ivan but as we were looking through uh, the GQs it was the 80s that were kind of slim. Picking. 
And I have to say that, you know, I've never, I don't regret the eighties and we did what we did, but it was kind of a conservative, you know, time yeah. for fashion. Things were really moving along very much. So I was happy to usher in the nineties. So I would have to say like, you know, any GQ from the eighties will definitely have a few regrets. In it. I have some of those parachute pants. If you remember those are pretty horrible. Um, yeah, okay. we, used to actually do, we actually used to do a little blurb in the front of the magazine called GQ Regrets, where right. we'd make fun of ourselves, And it was usually something in the 70s. And then when it crept into the 80s, I would, I would say, wait, be careful. I probably styled one of those pictures, but I, it, was, it was fun. It's, I think it's important to make fun of yourself. Right. Okay, let's do, there was, um, it's in Jihei Lee said, um, what major changes, developments in menswear do you see taking place in the next decade? So like, where do you think fashion is going? Well, I'm just, I think we're at the best time in men's fashion now. And I know you can say that anytime, like, did you say that about the nineties? But I think what we have now is we have such a diverse group of, of characters out there, whether they be designers or people, people wanting to be designers or making things in their garage or posting things on social media that are, you know, a riff on, on designer design. And I think what we're, you know, the kind of the shackles are off. And even though there is still a uniform of a suit and either, even if we have to wear glasses, we still wear glasses and we're certainly not, um, not wearing, you know, silver jumpsuits. But I'd have to say that the fact that there's so much diversity and so much choice and, you know, social media has really opened that up in a really big way. And I think, you know, you'll see it in GQ, you'll see it in Vogue, that a celebration of new designers and new models and new body shapes and you know just the fact that you know nothing really has to fit into a cookie cutter anymore and i think that's what's going to make it really exciting and that's just going to continue and i think this whole self-exploration that you know you don't not everyone has to wear the same thing or you don't have to go to a meeting you know with that blue shirt and tie on you can wear something that really expresses you and not be judged by it so i would hope that we turn into a less judgy society and that and that fashion to the forefront of that nice nice all right let's look um, um how has this is from austin right how has retouching and digital tools influenced your craft um change things you know, the, i don't know the guy you know, you retouch when you have to. I mean, we, we probably never had a heavy hand in that. I don't like, and you know, it's like, I'm, I've got this, I've got this formula for, for making a guy look like he has a little bit of a tan and it's just a little bit of a gel bronzer and some moisturizer. Cause I won't have makeup on a man's face. I just don't think it ever looks good because what happens then you end up kind of having to retouch the skin to look like it's not makeup. So I have to say that whenever we get to a point of retouching, especially on skin, it's a pretty light, light touch because we're, we're, we kind of nail that before we um, get to that stage. Um, retouching is great when you're trying to do photo illustration or when you're trying to you know, pump up a color here and there or maybe dial a curve to make it look more moody or whatever. I think those tools are, are, really, are really valuable. Um, but I've been noticing even even in Vibin that, you know, a lot of things look more natural and a little bit less, um, you know, Absolutely. dialed in. What, yeah. what would you have to say about that being a photo guy? I think there was, you know, with retouching, it went sort of started off, it was maybe too much for a long time, right? Things were over retouched, especially in women's fashion photography. And then it kind of settled down and got better and people, the craft got better. But now we're in really... A, a phase of realism, you know, and it's all about kind of reality and a lot of social issues have come into play. Um, diversity, which is a really wonderful thing. And, you know, um, and so I really think that it's about real naturalism is just really important right now. It may shift in the other direction at some point, but I just think it's really not about fixing things so much anymore, which I think is really healthy and really yeah. good. All right, so we're gonna do two more questions, Jeb. Oh, what is something you, this is from Liam Hanley. Uh, what is something you hate to see or do in the creative process? I is hate there you. Is there, you seem to, you love your work. You love what you do, but is there any part that you just like, ugh? I remember when I was an assistant, I used to hate to do the credits. <laughs> you had to have a clipboard on set and you had to actually write yeah. down, yeah. write down what the credits were. You're not and, that high. 
Because that 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 was was <laughs> it was like bookkeeping, you know? It's like, and I just wanted to like create, and uh, make the look uh, good. So that right. was like, that was a big thing for me. Well, I say that, um, <laughs> that I'd, have to, I'd have to say that with, um, sorry, one second. I'd say with today, I don't know, I, I, I especially, I just want people to always come to a shoot ready to take great images and to feel to, um, to, to feel good and and not to be afraid of, of um, you know, my favorite accessory is, is a sense of humor. And right. you know, that's why it's you're going to see it in the pictures of GQ or you're going to see it in any of my work. So we're going to have fun and we're going to have if we if if you don't want to have fun, we're going to we're going to try to like, you know, pull out of you the best we can. But I think like if everyone on, on set is in a good mood, you're going to take great pictures. If, if you know, if the celebrity is having a bad day, you, you just have to make it a good day. Great, great. Okay, we're going to do one more. Let's see if I can find. Um, oh, uh, was, let's see. Hold on. What kind of work are you looking at today? Who is including fashion? So just talking about what kind of work this is from uh, Kennedy Hodges. What kind of work are you looking at today? Who is influencing the fashion industry today? And what will define this era um, in terms of photography and fashion? Are there people that you're kind of, where do you kind of see, well, we can even say in the sense of like where you see men's fashion right now. I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the suit, but I think the suit's coming back in some ways or, but kind of where do you see things going? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because in addition to working as a consultant at GQ, I've got some other clients that I'm working with now and everyone is kind of asking that same question, like what lane should we be in? And you know, is it, you know, now that there's um, basically that the, the rule book has been thrown out, it makes it a little bit tough in the men's space because men are used to that 10 piece wardrobe and you know, maybe it can be, more colorful or less colorful, but it's always like a coat and a suit and a shirt and it used to be a tie. So I'd have to say that, you know, let's not forget about that coat of armor, that coat of armor that makes guys feel good, but let's experiment as much as possible, you know? And, and I was so excited when um, Alessandro Michele came on to Gucci and, you know, did a floral suit or, or Virgil did that incredible um, coat made out of with, with that material that looked like clouds. And I feel like, you know, those are extreme cases, but you know, I always try to encourage guys to buy something that's at least one piece that's really loud. And then that becomes your signature. And then you can wear that. It's actually more versatile than you think. So I think that we're in a really good place right now. I think that magazines are really encouraging young talent as far as photographers and designers. And I think we're kind of all in this together. And I feel like now that we don't have to worry so much about, you know, the newsstand sales, you know, that we don't have to worry about doing classic traditional covers anymore. You know, they can be shot by new photographers. They can be shot outside. They don't need a lot of retouching. And in a way that's, that's what's really refreshing right now. Excellent. Jim, thank you so much. It's been amazing. I'm going through the book with yeah. you. Guys, for everyone at SCAD and the students, it's been wonderful. We've loved spending time with you. And uh, hopefully we'll get to spend time with you again. So everyone be safe, be healthy, and we'll take care. Thank you so much. Do it again. Be safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Jim and Ivan. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Don't miss the next Guests and Gusto event at 5 p.m. with producer, writer, and director Morgan Neville. And check out SCAD Daily Fitness every day at noon. We'll also be joined by iconic actor Alan Cumming tomorrow at 11 a.m. Stay tuned for more events each week throughout the quarter. And we'll see you next time on Guests and Gusto.